Designers Café. The only long-term solution is to fix the ceiling and prevent any further stone fall. And no one is more keen to get on with it than the British engineers. For months now, they've been desperate to get back on site to position the airbags and persuade the Egyptians that their stainless steel anchors will reinforce the roof. But the scaffolding that will provide them with a working platform isn't even built yet. We were in limbo at that time. You would ring up and say, how's it going? And they'd say, two weeks. And then you ring in two weeks' time, they say, well, how long? Two weeks. So eventually you, you say, OK, give us a ring when it really is finished. We were at home waiting and waiting and waiting. At last, and surprisingly, there's a breakthrough. Hello. Give us a phone call, out of the blue. Scaffolding's up. Can you come out? Scaffolding's up. I couldn't believe it. Platform. Finally, they have a working platform. Bye. An emergency meeting is called. Braving a freezing Welsh winter, the Egyptian engineers arrive to see for themselves what the airbags can do. We will not at all exert no, we're not, upward pressure. We're not going to no. jack it up. We're yeah. just touch it. The trick will be when we go inside. They also bring with them detailed images of inside the pyramid. From the top of the scaffolding, they've been able to shoot the first ever close-up pictures of the burial chamber roof. The rocks have slid and wedged themselves, haven't they? These are very interesting photographs. Amazing. The ceiling is far more irregular than they imagined. There's no connection whatsoever. Positioning the airbags will be a major challenge, but doing nothing is not an option. We don't have any uh, support right now. So if we have major earthquake, of course, the stability of this roof would be uh, in jeopardy, yeah. Each airbag is tested, approved, and shipped to Egypt, marked urgent. So I assembled all the gear, and it arrived there. I booked my flights for January the 7th, and everything went pfft, the revolution. January the 25th, 2011, thousands of anti-government protesters occupy Cairo's streets. They call for the resignation of President Mubarak, who's held power in Egypt for over 30 years. After 18 days of violence, Mubarak cedes to the crowd's demands and resigns. The anarchy continues, putting Egypt's historic treasures at risk. Cairo Museum is attacked by thieves who take advantage of the chaos. On January 29th, I was between the people, and I tried to protect the museum, and the young people protected the museum with me. Outside the city, the situation is also critical. All the police and the military abandoned archaeological sites, and this was really a terrible thing. Half fixed, half broken, the step pyramid is more vulnerable than ever. The looters attack. The first day when the criminals and the thieves entered Saqqara, they opened the tomb of T. They opened the tomb of Meliruka. They opened all this famous tomb. Throughout Egypt, the chaos continues. And I was watching on the telly and I was getting scared. Scared because there was no police there. All my equipment was there. Was it still gonna be there when I got back into the country? Our agents didn't know any better as well. You could ring them and say, what's going on? Said, we have no idea. And the question then was, how long is this situation going to prevail before we can actually get there and intervene? I said to myself, Saqqara is finished. Abandoned, laid bare again by savage history, in the story of this pyramid, maybe the final die is cast. Four months later, the worst of the violence in Cairo recedes. Egypt is moving on. Now, at last, 
the British engineers get the call they've been waiting for. And they keep, keep ringing me every week, every week. Mr. Dennis, we need you out here, we need you out here. So um, we travelled in May. A quick check confirms that their luck has held. The equipment survives untouched. After so much uncertainty, they can finally get on with the job of installing the airbags. From the scaffolding that now fills the burial chamber, they get a close-up view of the challenge ahead. It was actually the first time that we had been in there and seen what we were up against. The higher they go, the worse it gets. We went up the ladder to the top deck. We just sat on the scaffolding, looking at the surrounding roof structure, which was nothing like we thought it was going to be. And I looked up at the ceiling. Now you're only inches from it. And there was just lots of mud, lots of clay. And it was frightening. And there was just this weird feeling. You felt as if there was a, a, a presence in there, and it wasn't me and Dennis, put it that way. I don't like it up here. <laughs> From that on, we thought, well, let's just get on with it and see what we're going to do. I didn't touch it. <laughs> I touched it. <laughs> but before they start to install the airbags, Dennis must adjust the scaffolding. Right now, there's nothing anchoring it to the burial chamber wall, and it's moving. Too much for Dennis's liking. Anyone going down the stairs or anything introduced so much vibration and swaying into the scaffolding. There's too many people up here. It's safety. He's on about all this safety. Get all get out here, <laughs> otherwise we're not starting. Dennis insists that they install reinforcing braces to minimise movement. We don't want any vibrations in here. Though that carries its own risks. <laughs> the pressure is on to install the airbags as soon as possible. Until I had them in, no one was safe. They start at the very top of the chamber. The irregular shape of the ceiling means it's impossible to get a perfect fit. Dennis and Mike carefully pack the voids with high-density foam. Any upward pressure could dislodge the fragile stonework. There was rocks falling. You'd only have to bump your head on when it'd fall down. With every bag they install, that danger recedes a little. But the ceiling is so unsafe, it's a much bigger job than they planned for. Because I wanted more of it supported, I didn't have enough airbags. Dennis has to call time out. I think that's enough for today. Come My on. heart rate needs to go down a bit. Are you going home? There's lots more to do, but already the bags are taking some of the pressure. When all 18 are in position, they could, in the event of a collapse, hold the calculated weight of the ceiling above. But they're only as strong as the scaffolding they sit on. And this one isn't built on solid rock. Previously, while clearing fallen debris from around the sarcophagus, the Egyptian team made an incredible discovery. A tunnel extending directly underneath the 100-ton stone coffin of the king. We discovered this tunnel. This tunnel was completely blocked and therefore we didn't know really how it looked like under the sarcophagus. They realized the tomb didn't rest on rock, but was precariously balanced on 18 limestone pillars. Building a 28-meter scaffolding on top of this fragile base seemed like madness. But that's exactly what was done here. To hold the weight of the massive steel structure, the floor was reinforced with hundreds of sandbags packed tightly beneath and around, creating a solid base upon which to build upwards to within touching distance of the roof, under which the race to restore the pyramid is entering a new and dangerous phase. The British engineers want to drill into the burial chamber roof and insert stainless steel anchors for a permanent fix but they have yet to convince the Egyptians of their plan. The final decision will rest with Dr. Hassan, 
And right now, he's worried that drilling directly into the ceiling would cause dangerous vibrations, perhaps even a collapse. Test after test is called for. We're trying to find which one is the optimum speed to, to give the least amount of vibration. The decision to drill or not won't be made quickly. No one wants to make a mistake. We're going to drill the next one on a solid surface. Meanwhile, there's other critical work to be done. Before boring holes in this pyramid, Dennis must stabilize the most precarious stones that are hanging as if by magic from the burial chamber roof. They'll use fresh lime mortar to fill the voids between the stones, gluing them together. But first, they must remove the old mortar, taking it apart piece by piece. These are the scary bits. To get into this corner of the burial chamber, Dennis has had to move the airbag that was supporting it. And now he's worried. Because these stones are just hanging there now. And it's a much bigger job than they first imagined. Now we are we opening a, a big gap. OK. Some of these gaps were a metre deep and 500 mil wide. No, it's too much. I can put all my arm on it. We were using a lot of lime mortar. Plastic tubes are used to pump grout into the biggest voids. With each stone that's secured, Dennis feels a little safer. Though in this pyramid, there's no such thing as completely safe. What happened? A new one, a new one. Every day is a challenge. But sometimes, it isn't all about engineering. To make a Mac, a unit. In the last few weeks, Dennis has been getting hands-on with history in a way most archaeologists can only dream of. And he's made what he thinks may be an important discovery. A hole in a corner of the burial chamber roof, behind which is a void extending some six metres into the ceiling. It could be an unusual collapse of stones, or it could be purpose-built. Another chamber or a shaft, perhaps, leading to who knows where. Before drilling into it, Dennis wants some specialist advice. And mummy expert Salima is only too happy to help. While restoration work is ongoing, she can't enter the pyramid. But this may be the next best thing. It looks really narrow. It's very confined, but it just continues up as far as we can see. So it sort of goes up like a chimney? Or... It looks like a chimney. OK. It draws up. In later pyramids, such as these in Giza, the burial chambers have northward-facing shafts, along which some believe the king's spirit can ascend to the afterlife. Could this be what lies behind this void? So, wait, wait, so you mean this is like the passages in exactly. the Great Pyramid, so this would be a precursor? This is facing north as it, well. Really? And they like it to face north. Yeah, they? of course, that's the entryway, that's the North Star, that's where you become one with the stars. Oh, how nice. Only when it's fixed will archaeologists be able to investigate this pyramid's many mysteries. On the outside, day by day, progress is reaching new heights. While on the inside, the race to restore the burial shaft is entering the most critical phase of all. That's what we're trying to prevent, catastrophic yeah. collapse. Yeah. Syntec's plan has always been to insert stainless steel anchors to secure the burial chamber roof. But they still need final sign-off from the Egyptian experts. And they don't have it. We need the decision. No one has said yes. To help force a decision, Dennis has called Richard and Peter to site. Actually drilling some holes in the pyramid chamber um, was a major step. I think the most dangerous areas were the stones that apparently had no connection to the rest of the body of stonework. The chimney, as Dennis calls it, is a real worry. But this is very fragile. It's all <laughs> tenuously held together. There can be no more delays. What we need now is something to say go. The engineers must decide whether to drill or not. These are going to be working anchors. I'm going to install anchors in these today. So we're, it's a corval okay. we're putting in. Yeah. A deal is struck. All right. OK. Let's start the second. The first anchor will be drilled in the far corner of the chamber wall. 
an X marks the spot. And they'd come to this position where they were now willing, and not only willing, but keen for us to get on with it. But then it come the day of the drilling. It was just taking it really carefully. This time, Dennis's right-hand man is drilling technician Malcolm. If somebody had told me 20 years ago that I'd be doing this inside a pyramid, most people don't even get to walk around one, let alone go inside and drill holes in it. But above the hole is a wooden beam surrounded by loose mortar. They wouldn't let us remove the mud from that beam because that mud is archaeology. So I was nervous. The Egyptians install measuring equipment to ensure the vibrations don't exceed safe levels. And Dr. Hassan wants to witness proceedings. Good morning, Dr. Good morning. Hassan. Good morning. Good morning. Ready? Finally, the moment that has been so long in the making. All right. All right. They begin to drill. Malcolm knows that in this game of Russian roulette, it's his finger on the trigger. When you're drilling, it's very sensitive. It's, it's not just a, a case of rock drilling. Uh, you, you have to put yourself in front of that drill bit and imagine what that drill bit is doing. Any moment, you could have tons of rock coming around your ears. And he has a unique way of thinking about the job. The drill is, is, is like a good woman. And if you push it too hard, it screams. Any screams in here, are indicative of high levels of vibration, the very thing the team want to avoid. You just know that that noise is going to come and I'm not going to let my finger off that trigger quick enough. Beyond the depth of the first stone, they'll be working blind. Because you didn't know what was between those stones. No one did. No one had taken this pyramid apart. Suddenly the sound everyone's been dreading. Malcolm has hit some old mortar that contains extremely hard pieces of flint and it's causing serious vibrations. Flint is one of the hardest materials to drill. We can drill it if it stays in one place. If it's bouncing around, it's impossible to drill. Suddenly, the vibrations peak. Dr. Hassan demands that they stop. 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 OK, we need to secure this stone. We're not moving this stone. It's this loose mud on the top of it that's coming down, isn't it? See? It's loose anyway, so it's... I was thinking we might be going home at any moment, you know. Your emotions are torn between are they going to kick us off site as having done some damage or are they going to embrace the fact that this... some damage may, be, may occur, but it's inevitable. But Dr Hassan is now committed. OK. He gives the go-ahead to resume drilling. <laughs> At last, they break through the flint. Yeah. But the drilling has taken much longer than they planned. And we ran out of time to install the anchor that night. I always worry about things. You know, if something happens in the pyramid, I'll think about it that night. I was worried about that hole that we drilled and leaving it open because we've taken something out of the pyramid without putting anything back. We were really keen to get those anchors in because those stones were defying gravity. You just can't afford that. Built 4,600 years ago, the Step Pyramid is a foundation stone in the history of architecture. It's why people are risking all to rescue it. But Dr. Howarth and his team are not the first to try. All through the burial chamber, there's evidence of previous restorations that took place thousands of years ago. By then, the Step Pyramid was already an ancient structure. When the ancient Egyptian in the side period 500 BC found out that this room is falling down, and that's why they put this to hold, to hold the stones. This is dated back 2,500 years ago. But there's one piece of wood that's an anomaly, a plank amongst all the tree trunks. You can't get a support in them. 
To make way for the restoration, Dennis has asked the archaeologists to remove it, only to discover when the millennia of debris is wiped away that this plank has a story all of its own. One that Salima is delighted to explain. It's a coffin. It is, is it? It's a coffin of the late period, probably 26th or later. Can you go next? Oh, uh, wait, go back, go back, go back. Oh, that's probably the dead person. Techen something. Some of the hieroglyphs are instructions for the dead person in the afterlife. I shall not walk backward. I shall not stand upside down. I shall not eat excrement. Those are all things that they say. Well, obviously, one needs to look at this, the text more carefully, but we can try and at least under start to understand what went on. Next morning, Dennis is back on site preparing to install the first of the stainless steel anchors in the burial chamber roof. Inserted up to lengths of five meters, they will pin the loose rocks together and transfer the weight of the ceiling higher up into the pyramid, preventing further collapse. Each piece of stainless steel is covered with a mesh sock that will be pumped with liquid grout. Inside the ceiling, this grout will expand to take on the shape of any voids between the stones, bonding them together. Dennis knows how badly this burial chamber needs it. Every time one of the anchors goes in, I feel a bit more safer. It will take 72 anchors to secure the whole roof, and the first are the most critical. Getting the first two anchors in place is a major step because you've almost demonstrated that this system will work. After centuries of decay, it's come down to a battle against the clock. The grout must be cooled to around 17 degrees Celsius. Not an easy job in Egypt. The temperature of the water out here from the tap is about 24 degrees, which is too warm to mix the grout, so we have to use ice to cool the water down. If it's left too long, the grout goes off and won't flow around the anchor. Each of the anchors can take a capacity of up to eight tons. It gently does it. Debris could have gathered in this hole overnight. And if the sock rips, the anchor will be ineffective. At last, they inject the grout and start to plug the holes. That's the first one. Yep. One done. The race to save this pyramid is not over, but an end is in sight. That was the trickiest one, that first one going in. And it's just a case of repeating itself now. Brilliant. It's been five years since the British and Egyptian engineers teamed up to fix this pyramid. Since then, they've cleared 350 cubic metres of rubble, replaced thousands of boulders, pointed, drilled, and anchored the first stone pyramid ever built. Together they have performed architectural surgery, leaving the smallest of scars. We had all the ingredients, the technical challenges, the rebellion. This is the most important job we've ever done. When all the anchors are in position, the airbags can be deflated, the scaffolding removed, and the burial chamber guaranteed protection for a few more centuries. It's that buzz that goes through the company that you feel, yeah, you've done something that's really amazing. Personally, just having the experience of working on this monument has been wonderful. Rescued from turning to dust, this pyramid's many secrets are ready to be revealed. I think we should open this step pyramid to the public. It belongs to everyone all over the world. It's always nice to see these buildings given a new lease of life. And we've just given this one a new lease of life.